Okay, we're going to get started in a moment or two. But I just want to say that the paper I mentioned yesterday where they have a correct way of correcting for um, the length of the gene for single cell RNA-seq is this paper. And they've just contacted me this morning telling me that the package um, implementing the model uh, is now available in beta release uh, here, if you are interested. Good morning. Yep. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to continue today with our analysis. So I, I got a question just now about yesterday's last chapters. So when we did the batch correction at the end of those chapters, uh, we didn't save the skater object. But if you do your own analysis, so the thing that you would do is uh, you do the quality control, normalization, then batch correction, then you need to save skater object and then use this object in the further downstream analysis. So we didn't save it yesterday because we're going to use different data sets today. So we only worked with that data set yesterday. But in your own analysis, you would probably save it and then use it afterwards. So <coughs> today we're going to talk about uh, more interesting things to me, at least. So if you remember in the first in the first chapters, we had this diagram uh, of what we do with uh, single cell data. So yesterday we covered these steps until confounders. And today we're going to talk about real downstream analysis, basically. The, the analysis that you do to find out biological signals in your data set. So we start with the clustering, and um, this is probably the most obvious thing you want to do with your data set, uh, because when, when you don't know anything what's, what's, what's in your data, you just want to see what, what's the structure, if there are any groups, if there are any clusters. And this is the best first step to do with any single cell data set. So we, uh, I'm going to talk about unsupervised clustering. So this clustering is when you don't know any a priori information about your data set. So you want to cluster it without any knowledge. Um, and the usual thing in clustering is that before you do the real clustering, you first reduce uh, dimensionality of your data set. And single cell data sets are very high dimensional, as we know. So the number of genes in the human genome is about 20,000. So you have 20,000 dimensions. And for clustering, this is a very hard problem. And usually, when you have so many dimensions, actually clustering doesn't perform well. So what we want to do, we want to reduce dimensions. And we want to keep the information important uh, from your data in those few dimensions. <coughs> so yesterday, we already covered uh, two methods for dimensionality reductions, which are PCA and CSNE. So you can, uh, you can have a look again at those chapters. Um, and the next step after dimensionality reduction is uh, the actual clustering. So uh, I will and briefly go through some of the methods that you can use for that. So hierarchical clustering, k-means clustering, and graph-based uh, clustering. In hierarchical clustering, um, so uh, the cells are initially assigned uh, to, uh, to some clusters, and then those clusters can be merged together. Uh, and, and the next step, you merge more and more. And this, in this way, you create a hierarchy. So you can go from top to bottom or from bottom to top. And this is the probably one of the 
most popular algorithm. So when you plot a heat map in R, usually it, it does hierarchical clustering for you by default. So you, you, you can see those dendrograms on top of your plot. This is hierarchical clustering. Um, the second approach to clustering is k-means. In k-means, uh, the goal is to partition n cells into k different clusters, but we need to define k uh, before we do the clustering. So in this method, you actually say, I want to find five clusters, for example. And then in this algorithm, in iterative manner, cluster centers. So first it randomly assigns uh, cluster centers to some random cells. But then by computing the similarity between the cells, it assigns the neighboring cells uh, to this cluster. And then once those uh, cells are assigned, it recalculates the cluster center and assign the cells again. And in this iterative manner, at the end, uh, you want to get a stable solution uh, where you have the K clusters. And the last method is graph-based. Uh, so in this uh, case, you first create a graph based uh, on your data. And then you try to find communities inside the graph. There are lots of algorithms available. So this is one of just a representation of how it works. Once you have a graph, you have connections between the cells. You try to find which uh, nodes in the graph are closer to each other. So what are the challenges in the clustering algorithms? Uh, first of all, uh, we don't know the number of clusters K in our data set. So some of the algorithms, for example, the ones that use K means, they would require you to provide K before running the analysis. Some of the algorithms can find K for you, uh, but then you have to rely on this estimated K. Uh, the second problem is scalability. So usually clustering methods are quite slow. Uh, like they work really nice for smaller data sets, but then when you go to hundreds of thousands of cells or million cells, they become very slow. And it's really hard to cluster your data set. And recently, the number of, in the last two years, the number of cells in single cell data sets increased from 100 to 1 million. So there was a 1 million data set recently made available by 10x genomics. <coughs> and uh, tools are not user friendly, so there are actually lots of tools available, but some of them are very hard to use. Maybe there is no documentation, there is no description of parameters, so it's really uh, intuitively it's hard to understand why they perform so in this way or in that way. So this is another problem for clustering. Uh, <clears throat> so we're gonna cover several tools that are available at the moment. Um, so the first one is Sincera. This, this clustering method is based on simple hierarchical clustering. The data is converted to Z-scores before clustering. And also this method can identify K for you, number of clusters K. Um, I will show you later how it does it. The second method is PCA reduce. Um, so this one combines PCA and k-means clustering, and also it does iterative hierarchical clustering. Um, so, so main things here: PCA, k-means, and hierarchical clustering. Then SC3 method. This this method developed by our group. Here we also use PCA, uh, some spec spectral dimensionality reduction, which I didn't cover here, uh, and also k-means. Another method is to use TSNE plus k-means. So I, I talked about TSNE yesterday. You can, you can create a TSNE map, and then you can find clusters on that map using, for example, k-means algorithm. So this is probably not the best way to do it, but we just show how it works. And the last one is Surat. Uh, so, um, yeah, so in the previous course, we actually used the, the old version of Surat, but now 
they released a new version, number 1.4. The problem with this is that they have changed the clustering algorithm completely. So in the past, uh, the clustering was based on TSNE map. So they plotted the TSNE map and then they used some uh, density clustering to find clusters on the map. Now they have changed to graph-based methods. So they create a graph from your data and find communities in the graph. And they use, this method is actually the same as uh, the one published by these people here. So originally it was uh, applied to site of data, but then uh, single cell community also tried it and it worked nicely. And what's good about this method is that uh, it works with large, larger data sets. So you can really cluster up to probably 100,000 cells using this method and it's quite fast. <coughs> The last method is SNN click. That was probably one of the first ones uh, for the single cell data. Um, it's also graph based and um, uh, it, it does some community detection and also it finds the number of clusters for you. So here you get a single output. It says, for example, you have 10 clusters and the clusters are this. And that, that's what you get from this tool. Um, okay, so let's go to the real date. Oh, sorry, yeah, questions? Um, yeah. Are these two first two methods that you just talked about, are they used for other types of data? Yes, so the question is, are these tools cell single cell specific or can we use them for other data sets? Um, some of them are specific, some of them are probably general. But I suppose in these packages, if you take them from Bioconductor or any other website, they would be specific. So you probably would need to change the parameters uh, to get optimal solution for another type of data. So, well, in general, for example, PCA and K-means are general algorithms. They're not, there is no specificity in those ones, but there are some things inside these algorithms, other things which are, can be specific. I'll actually show you in SC3, for example, in our tool, we have a very specific region of eigenvectors that we use for clustering, which is, we, we validated it on, on the single cell data, so we can't actually promise that it will be the same, that it will be optimal for another data type. But you can change these parameters for another data set manually. <coughs> okay, so let's start with this, um, with the clustering example. So now we're gonna use a different data set. So we're not going to use tank data set that we used yesterday. We're gonna use this one, pollen data set. It consists of uh, human IPS cells. Oh, sorry, no, I'm wrong. So these are human tissues. Uh, so this, uh, this data set we have uh, as a scatter object so this pollen RDS file is already a scatter object, which is ready for you to go. You don't need to create it yourself. And cell type one column in the pheno data is actually the cell type information about, uh, <coughs> which we actually, we, we got it from the, from the publication. So these are cell types reported by the authors in the original publication. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare clustering methods results with this data, right? So we, 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 we say that this is the reference. We think that this is the true, the truth, and we want to compare clustering results with the truth and see it, whether they are different or not. So this is probably the common approach to benchmark clustering methods for single cell data. The only problem is that there are only a few data sets available like, like this data set where you can know for sure that these cell types are exactly the cell types that you have in the data. So sometimes from the biological design you can say, yes, so this is cell type one, this is cell type two, this is cell type three. And then when you cluster, you can compare your clustering to this ground truth. But in majority of the cases, uh, they have the data and they cluster it using their own methods and then they report the cell types 
but this is already, this cannot be stored as a ground truth because it was decoded from the computational tool. So the problem is that there are only a few data sets like that where the ground truth is known. So from the biological, from the design of the experiment, you know that you have this number of cell types. Uh, that's why b benchmarking for single cell is very hard. It's because when you go to a publication, they report uh, cell types based on their own clustering method, but then you have to believe them that their method is good enough to get the cell types from the data. Yeah, we use this data set in SC3 paper to benchmark our method against other methods. So in SC3 paper, it's, it will become available at the end of March. So it, it was accepted for publication. So in SC3 paper, we compare all these methods that I'm covering here to each other. So you can go to the paper and see how they perform on different data sets. So this is one, this one of the data set that we use. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally, you would you would like to do that. Yeah. So the question is, uh, in in some data sets, there is a lot of information that can define your cell types, uh, whereas the clustering methods in unsupervised clustering is when you you don't tell the algorithm any information a priori, so it just tries to identify the clusters based on what you have in the data. So I agree with you, but I think there are only a few data sets when you really know uh, what cell types are there. In most of the cases, people ask the question. We, we think that there is a subpopulation of cells but we don't know what it is and we try to find it. So if you, if you really know, you can check the marker genes and then probably you don't need to do clustering. So you can just look at few genes, but then you don't need to do single cell RNA-seq uh, analysis, right? You can only sequence those genes, like do PCR uh, and that's enough. So here the power is in that you uh, sequence the whole genome. So, and you try to base your analysis on the whole genome. So it's kind of, you g it gives you more power in a way. And then if you find the marker genes, which you already knew about, that's a better result to me, right? Instead of um, starting with the marker genes. Uh, Yes, so yeah. Okay, so you, you can do both at the same time, yeah. But then, I mean, if you do PCR, you get your results is more robust, right? In single cell, you, you might, for the same genes, you will get a lot of noise. So that, that can be a problem. Uh, okay, so let's go through the analysis. So this is our data set. If we look at it, this is a scatter object. We have 300 cells, 23,000 genes. Um, so here we have the cell IDs. These are the columns from the phenodata uh, table. These are the gene names. Um, so this is the columns from the geno data, fra data frame. So basically when you, when, when you uh, just type the, the skater object name in R and press enter, it will show you quite a lot of information about the skater object. <coughs> so then if you look at the, at the cell type column, um, these are the cell types that were reported by the authors, and this is the number of cells in each cell type. So in total we have 300 cells, and they are spread over different cell type categories in this data set. Now if we plot PCA of this data set and we want to color the cell types on this plot, 
so this is this is the PCA plot, and as you can see, actually PCA already finds uh, majority of the cell types. So, for example, these three cell types are separated on the PCA plot. Here you have something which is a bit, a bit mixed, so it's it's harder to identify groups from the PCA plot, but still orange dots are here, red dots are here, and so on. So actually this shows you like if, if your data set is, is of good quality and the cell types are separated, you don't need to perform any complicated analysis. Just a simple PCA plot sometimes can be enough to find your clusters, right? Okay, so we'll start with SC3. Um, so SC3, we integrated it with the skater functionality. So as an input to SC3, you can provide the skater object, so you don't need to modify anything to create a new data frame. And uh, so SC3 consists of several steps, uh, which we'll go through. So the first step, we want to prepare information for SC3. It's just a very simple function. You say, I want to use this data set and I want to look at k's from two to five. So in SC3, we, uh, we try to make it as flexible as possible so you can, you can visualize results for different k's and see which one looks the best. Because usually when you have only one single k number, uh, you cannot be sure that this is the best solution. So you need to try different k's and see how they look like. Uh, how your data looks like for different case. Um, so SC3 also has a function uh, which can estimate the K for you. So if we run it on this data set, actually we find the 11 clusters, which is equivalent to the number of cell types reported by the authors, so that's, that's a good sign. SC3 was able to find the same number of clusters as reported in the original publication. So then we're gonna run the analysis using this number of clusters. So here I'm not defining, so in the past, in the previous line of code, um, I defined it from two to five because I didn't know what it was. Now because I know that it's 11, I just run it for 11, just to save time because it may take a bit of time if you run it for more clusters. And also uh, we wanna, uh, define this parameter, which is biology. By default, it's false. But if you make it true, uh, what happens is SC3 will <coughs> calculate differential express genes, marker genes, and outlier cells for you for, for a given number of K. So for, for the K equals 11, it will find differential express genes, marker genes, and outlier cells. So if you run this, this function, just SC3, uh, so you will see this output, it will do quite a lot of things. <coughs> and um, probably the best way to do it, so we'll go through this very quickly. So if you, you can then visualize all the results using the interactive session. So if you run SC3 interactive pollen, it should open a new session in a web browser, and then you can actually see all these images that I'm gonna show you now. So let me know when you, when you open the interactive session in a web browser. Yeah. Sorry? Two to five. Two to five is just random numbers. I was just, I didn't know what, how many clusters I have in the data set. So what do you mean by two to five? Uh, yeah, so when you open the interactive session, you will see that your K is 11. But if you run a C3 from two to five, you will be able to change K from two to five. So two, three, four, five. And it will show you results for each K separately. So you can explore different case and see which one is the best, right? Because then we, we identified K as 11 and we know that there are 11 cell types. I didn't run it for more than 
just 11, right? But you can, you can run from 10 to 12, for example, and see how 10 and 12 are different from 11. Yeah. It depends on the data set, so probably start from two, <laughs> right? And then see, gradually increase it. Depending also on the cell size, oh, on this uh, data set size. So SS3 is actually is not super fast, so because it does a lot of, uh, the algorithm itself is uh, you run clustering with different parameters, different dimensionality reductions, different number of eigenvectors, so we get quite a lot of clustering results in one go, but then it merges everything using consensus clustering, which makes the result very stable. So it finds the average over different clustering solutions. Uh, and that's why it takes quite a lot of time to run. So we found that, uh, so we have this in the paper, uh, SC3 will run about half an hour for a data set of 5,000 cells. Uh, if you want to have more cells, then it becomes very slow. So that's why I didn't run it <coughs> for this one, for, for k more than just, I, I j just took one value of k. Uh, well, for, for, for 300 it's fine, you can run it. For 5000 is also, on, I, I ran it on my laptop for 25 minutes, I think. So it becomes slow with large number of cells. That's why I mentioned that Surat is actually performing better for larger data sets. But for smaller data sets, it's very fast. So, so have you managed to open the interactive session? Okay, so the first plot that you see in the interactive session is this one. It's a consensus matrix. So as I mentioned just now, uh, SC3 runs lots of clustering pipelines at the same time, and then average the clustering results over these several uh, outputs. And the average is actually the consensus matrix. So what it shows you, you have, you have cells in columns and cells in rows, and the value in the matrix tells you whether the cells belong to the same cluster by, by reported by the majority of the clustering algorithms or that they belong to different clusters. So for example, if you take this cell and this cell, you find the, uh, the value in the matrix, it's one, right? So we have from zero to one, the scale here. So it means that all of the clustering algorithms found that these two cells belong to the same cluster, right? If you take, for example, this cell and this cell, you find the intercept, it's zero. This means that all of the clustering algorithms found that these two cells belong to different clusters, right? There are some values where they actually range between zero and one. In this case, it means that some of the clustering algorithms found that those cells belong to the same clusters, but some of them found that they belong to different clusters. So the perfect situation is that you have completely red diagonal and completely blue off-diagonal elements. In this case, all of the clustering algorithms agree with each other, and all your cells you have you have perfectly identified cell clusters. So here we can see that we found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight of the clusters, uh, the algorithms agree with each other. <coughs> These three clusters, you can see that uh, there was some disagreement between the algorithms, but still uh, there is quite a lot of red on the diagonal. So, <coughs> So this is the first plot that you see. And then when you have multiple k's, for example, your k is from 10 to 12 when you run SC3, you can change k and you can see how consensus matrix changes for different k. And then you can find out which, which consensus matrix is the best. So the next plot in SC3 is the CLED plot. This is a, uh, so compared to the previous plot, when we visually e explored the consensus matrix, here you have a quantitative way of exploring the consensus matrix. So for each cluster, it tells you about the average, about the silhouette width, 
which it's, you, you can have a look on Wikipedia what it is, but, but actually what it shows you is kind of stability of the cluster. So the first cluster at 0 0.98, so it was not perfect. There was something a bit different. These clusters are perfect once. These three clusters that we found on the consensus metrics are not perfect, as you can see, and these two are perfect. So the more you have, the more black you have on this plot, the better. And then it also reports the average silhouette width. So if it's one, then you have a perfect uh, block diagonal structure on your consensus metrics. If it's less than one, then it becomes, uh, there is some disagreement between the clustering algorithms. <coughs> so you can also uh, plot uh, the expression metrics uh, based on the SC3 clustering solution. So here we have the same clusters as we saw on the consensus metrics. The cell types are highlighted in the same way. And al also sh this map shows you the gene expression of your data set. So this is your data actually. Uh, on the x-axis we have, by default, we have 100 clusters. So instead of plotting all the genes, which is 20,000, it's very hard to plot on the heat map, we cluster the genes using simple k-means algorithm. And uh, so those centers of those 100 clusters are shown here. So it's the same thing a bit different from the original data set, but in general it shows you your, your data. And you can see from this why uh, the clustering algorithms found those clusters for you. You can see uh, the differences between the clusters and where they differ and why uh, those clusters were identified. <coughs> so as I mentioned before, because we asked SC3 to calculate biological information as well. Uh, it finds out marker genes for you. So you, you have it in, in the interactive session, uh, but you can also plot everything. Also all the plots that you see in the interactive session, you can plot in the command line as well. So these are the functions that you should use. Um, and so what we mean by the marker genes, uh, as Martin, explained yesterday. So the marker genes in SC3 are identified using the, uh, you know, this re, uh, rock curve operator. So basically we look at, at the clusters and we find the genes <coughs> which are mostly expressed in one of them and not expressed in the others. Um, and then we f find all genes for every cluster. But on this plot, we only report top 10 from each cluster. So if you go then to, all, also all the results are saved in the same skater object. So if you have results for the cells, they would be saved in the pheno data table. If you have results for the genes, they would be saved in the geno feature data table. Uh, and this, because these are gene results, this information will be available in the feature data table. Uh, and it will also show you the values for each gene. So uh, this is the top gene, the second one, and there will be some values related to this. Uh, so we found this very useful feature, and uh, this is probably the most popular feature of SC3. People usually want to find marker genes in their data set. That's probably one single task that people want to, to do with their data set. <coughs> So, yeah, there is also, if you look in your interactive session, there is also differentially expressed genes uh, tab. Uh, compared to marker genes, differentially expressed genes are defined as genes which have at least one difference between any of the clusters. So if there is something different between any two clusters, then those genes will be identified as differentially expressed. So we don't do pairwise comparisons between each pair of clusters, but instead we just look over across all the clusters, and if there is any difference between any two, those, those genes are reported as differentially expressed. And you have some p-values there, but we don't recommend to use them as real p-values, so just probably use them for, for ranking of your genes, because 
those p-values, as Davis mentioned yesterday, we, we get these p-values after doing the clustering. So they're kind of biased already because the clustering is based on the same data. data. So probably better use these p-values just for ranking of the genes. And the last one, there is a cell outlier tab, which I don't show in this presentation, but you have it in your interactive session. So cell outliers are defined as cells which are different, which are quite far away from the center of the mass of, of the cluster that they belong to. So you have like the cell was assigned to one of the clusters. The algorithm finds the gravity of the center of gravity of the cluster. And if this, the cell is far away from the center, it's reported as an outlier from this cluster. So if you look at the plot, you have the outlier score. The higher is the score, the stronger is the outlier. And this information is also saved in your Fino data table in your scatter object. <coughs> because of the integration with scatter, you can, you can use all the scatter functions on, the, on this object because it's a scatter object. But then you can also use the SC3 results in your plot. So here we plot PCA of pollen, but we want to color it by the results of SC3. And as you can see, it's very similar to, to the previous plot that we saw before, because the cell types that were identified by SC3 were mostly the same as reported by the authors. So the color scale here is actually continuous, so it's not, it's not very clear, but still the same cell types. <coughs> so we have some exercises here. Okay, so actually I didn't run it for several cases, but now you have it as an exercise. So you can run SC3 for, from nine to, to 13. So you define K, nine, uh, column 13. And then you explore different clustering solutions in your web browser. Um, then you can find out which clusters are the most stable. So yeah, so when you run SC3 for multiple Ks, there, there will be another tab which is called stability, and it will show you which clusters are stable across different K solutions. So if you change K from 10 to 11, and your cluster doesn't change, then this cluster be, is reported to be stable. So when you run it for multiple case, you will get stability score for each of, the, of your clusters. So you can find out which clusters are the most stable. Um, check out differential express genes and marker genes. We, we already have done that. Um, and yes, for the marker gene threshold, uh, for the marker genes, you have several parameters that you can change. By default, we use 0 0.85. Uh, from the rock curve operator. So you can change this. this. We found this from looking at several different single cell data sets. So if you choose this, this would be very strict, but those marker genes will be definitely marker genes. You can make it a bit lower, you will find more marker genes if you, if you don't find a lot in your data set. Um, so yeah, please, please run, at least run this and look at the interactive session and see how you can change Ks from 9 to 13. Any questions so far? Okay, so I got quite lots of questions about the interactive session. So I'm probably run it myself on the screen. So let's see. So we go to the clustering chapter 18. Um, so I will go, I will run everything until this point, right? So this will create all the plots that you saw, identify the 11 clusters. Uh, and then I want to run SC3 from 10, from 9 to 13. So I don't want to run it for 11. Where is my console? So I just type this, right? 
9 to 13. This might take some time, but we'll wait for it. And then we'll open the interactive session, OK? So um, meanwhile, there was a question about the Poland date set. So Poland date set, um, as I mentioned, is 300 cells, 23,000 genes. Uh, the cell types that we look at here were identified by, by the authors of the publication, right? So we just rely on their knowledge and their experience, and we say that these are the ground truths cell types. We use them as the reference. And they are stored in the cell type 1 column of the skater object. Is it clear? Um, so because they're stored in the object, you can visualize them. Sorry? Uh, OK. Uh, if I can. Can I increase the font in our studio? Anybody knows how to do it? Well, there is zoom in here. Does it work? Oh, yeah, I think it works. Thank you. So uh, can you see it now? So where are the cell types? The cell types are here, right? So this is information from the authors. And because we have it in the skater object, we can visualize it on any plot. You can plot PCNE, you can plot PCA, you can plot uh, diffusion plots. So a lot of options in Skater. And then we run SC3. So these things are, we need those to, to estimate K in the beginning. So if you don't want to estimate K, you don't need to do it. But here we do it. Um, it finds K for us. And then... To run SC3, you actually just use SC3 function. It's using expression slot. Yes. The expression slot, we talked about it yesterday. So by default, when you create a skater object, if you provide counts, it will create log 2 CPM of your count. This will be expression slot. But then when you do normalization and batch correction, most of the functions write the output to the same expression slot. So expression slot is usually your working slot for the skater object. And SC3 works with the expression slot, but actually there is a parameter in this function where you can define another slot if you want to. So you can you can adjust it. Yeah. Uh, good question. I don't remember. You can find it in the paper already, yeah. So it basically it creates uh, Yeah, I forgot the details, to be fair. <laughs> well, for this data set it is because it's quite a clean data set. So yeah, the question is, <coughs> if we, if do we, can we rely on this k, estimated k parameter? <coughs> so I would say, in the beginning, if you don't know anything about your data set, you probably it's good to run this, and then explore different k's around this value, because it's usually close to the truth, let's say, <laughs> but sometimes it's it's wrong. So. So as you can see, SC3 is still running. That's because we asked for from 9 to 13. So it's 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So it, it runs clustering five times. And also, it, it calculates the biological uh, results. This also takes quite a lot of time. <coughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. So the question is, if we say we have, have say, 1,000 cells, we don't want to wait long. We subsample, uh, sample 300 cells from this data set, run a C3 on 300 cells, and then if we like the results, we kind of uh, in extrapolate them to the, the whole data set. Uh, so you actually, you have this feature in SC3. So as I said, it works good, nice for five, up to 5,000 cells. But if you have more, it struggles. So what we did is we have another approach. So if your data set is very large, you can actually use SC3 with any data set size. But by default, if the data set is more than 5,000 cells, SC3 will sample 5,000 cells for you from this data set randomly and class to those 5,000 cells. Uh, then you can look at everything that we looked at for 5,000 cells. You find your favorite solution. And then you run the SVM prediction algorithm. And it will find the cell labels for the rest of the cells based on this clustering solution. So this functionality is, is implemented in SC3. And you can change it. So instead of 5,000, you can say 300. So you, you will do clustering of 300 and predict all these other 700 cells based on this solution. So the cells that are similar, for example, you, you clustered your 300 cells. You found the clusters. So and th there is a cell which hasn't been in those 300 cells. So if it's similar to the cluster, one, it will be assigned to cluster one by SVM. So SVM just looks at the similarity between the cells. <laughs> SVM, I think SVM is deterministic. I'm not sure about the details. Yes, you, you, you might want to run it multiple times. So this is a bad approach if you have uh, rear cell types in your data. Because when you sample, you can miss out the rear cell types. Uh, but we run we run SC3 for Makosko. So in the paper, you can have a look. We we have clustering of Makosko data set for 45,000 cells. So we only used 5,000 cells and predicted the other 40,000 cells, and we get quite similar results to what they have in Serrat publication. So it's it works, but not recommended. OK, so I think SC3 is finished. So now we can, once it's finished, we can open it in an interactive session using this command here. Right? So and now, as you can see, we have k from 9 to 13, right? So you have a slider here, and you can change k and see how your consensus matrix changes for different case. So, and also, as I mentioned, there is the stability plot. So for, for k equals 9, it tells you that eight clusters are quite stable with stability of almost 1. So 1 is the best stability. So the cluster doesn't change once you, when you change k. This cluster is unstable. That's what it tells you. <clears throat> so if you go back to consensus, here on the, on the left-hand side, you also have uh, phenodata information. So these uh, checkboxes are taken from the phenodata table of your skater object. So th these are the ones, uh, the parameters that you can use on PCA plot, PSNE plot, when you say color by or shape by or size by, and you can also use them in SC3. So if you want to visualize the reference cell types, you click here, and it will show you the, the reference cell types. So this is from the Poland publication, as I mentioned before. If you want to look at the total counts of your cells, you can also find, for example, that this cluster the number of total counts in these cells is much higher than in this cluster. So there, there might be some technical issue 
and that's why those cells were separated in different clusters. Usually you would like to have some uniform distribution of counts, right? You can also look at uh, total features. So this is number of expressed genes in your cells. So they quite correlate with the total count, as you can see. Uh, and so on. So all the information inside the scatter object is available from SC3. So the silhouette plot I told you about already, stability, expression. Yeah, so expression takes a bit of time to plot because it's a heat map. And uh, as I said, we, we cluster the genes to 100, uh, 100 clusters because it, it's not possible to visualize all 20,000 genes. And the problem is here is that every time you run it, you run it, you get different order of the clusters. So if your heat map changes, don't be scared because it's the same heat map, it's just the order of the clusters changes. Differentially expressed genes, as I mentioned, if there is at least one difference between any two clusters, it will be reported as differentially expressed. So obviously you get all the marker genes as differentially expressed genes as well because there is a difference between one cluster and everything else. But also you have genes where, for example, it is expressed, it can be expressed <coughs> in some of the clusters and not expressed in one or two other clusters. So this is not a marker genes, but it is a differentially expressed gene. Um, and this is marker genes that you saw in the presentation. So yeah, that's it. And if you change K, you can see how marker genes change as well. And because this is already pre-calculated, so all the biological information is pre-calculated already, so it, it takes it doesn't take any time to plot, which is nice. Usually consensus metrics, so you need to go back to consensus. So here we see there is some instability here. Uh, if we change K to 10. So I suppose what happened is those two clusters were merged together, right? You might want to have it, you might not, I don't know. So it's, uh, so it's, it's, yeah, so I think it's similar to quality control. It's, it's your choice. So it, 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 it's hard to say, but if you want to be completely quantitative, you should look at the silhouette plot and at, at this value, average silhouette width. So it should be one for the perfect clustering. So if we change K from nine, 0 0.96, 0 0.93, 0 0.94, 0 0.93, 0 0.9. So actually nine is the highest value, right? K equals nine. And if we look at the consensus, when K equals nine, you actually merge all three clusters together and it becomes more block diagonal in this case because all these instabilities are inside the same cluster now. So, I mean, the conclusion is that these cell types, uh, 23, 38, what else, GW16, so, what it means, these cell types are very similar to each other. That's why it's very hard to resolve them. Okay, so any questions on SC3? And you can go to Bioconductor webpage and there is a vignette there with all the details, all the parameters, or everything described. So there is quite a lot of things I, I can understand. It's hard to follow, but if you're interested, just go to the Bioconductor webpage. All right, I'm going, I'm going to switch to the next tool. So the next tool is PCA Reduce. So PCA Reduce, it's not integrated with Skater, so we have to export the uh, expression metrics from our Skater object. 
that's what we do. We create an object, we create a uh, matrix, input matrix, and we say we want it to store expression values from our Poland data set. And what we use here is we use SS3 gene filter. So that's what I didn't explain. SS3 internally has a gene filter. Uh, you can look at the details in the paper as well. It's just to reduce the dimensions of your data set. For, because for clustering, a lot of genes are non-informative. So you want to remove those genes before doing the clustering. It saves you computational time. Um, so as, sorry? For, for the gene filter? Yeah. So default in SC3 is, is actually, if the gene is expressed in less than 10% of the cells, it is removed. Or if the gene is, is expressed in more than 90% of the cells, it is also removed. And that's the default gene field in SC3. Usually those genes that are expressed in less than 10%, uh, depending on, on your structure, you can, you can change these values. Yeah. But this is, this is quite a strict gene filter, just to make your data set a bit smaller. So PCA reduce also operates, because it operates on the expression matrix, uh, they recommend to use some gene filter to reduce dimensionality of your data set. We don't know anything else, so we just use SS region filter. Um, and then, so here, here is the description of what it does. Um, so these are the parameters that you have to define, NBT, Q, S, M, there are quite a lot of them. And you need to run this command. So you run PCA reduce, you need to transpose your matrix because it operates on the transposed expression matrix. And you define these parameters. So here we run it only once. Uh, they, in the paper, they, they run it, they, you can run it multiple times. It's a stochastic method. So if you run it multiple times, you get different solutions. Um, so this, is, this goes back to the user-friendliness of the tools. So I think this tool is not very user-friendly. Uh, it's very, well, it's hard to, uh, to get the result from, from, from after you run it. So first of all, because there are lots of parameters, which is hard to understand if you are a beginner. And, um, but this is how we get the result for 11, for k equals 11. So just follow these instructions here. <coughs> 32 is the, so it's because as I mentioned, it, it uses hierarchical clustering algorithm. So it does, it hierarchically does PCA and k-means at every step. So it starts from these 30 clusters and then it merges, I think, I'm not sure, but I think it merges then, like it does 30 steps. At every step it merges two uh, clusters together. And that's why in the result you actually have a hierarchy of your cells from two clusters to 32, sorry, from two to 30. And that's why, because we're interested in uh, k equals 11, we need to extract it from the data matrix, this solution. So you actually have 30 solutions for k from two to 30. And 30 is the, the starting parameter. So you need to define this from which uh, k you start, and then you start merging the cells with each other. So we, we look at the number 11. Um, so as you can see, there is some from here, for example, uh, there are two clusters that are identified by PC reduce. Uh, but otherwise, these clusters are fine, and those are, they look fine as well. No, no. So that's, that's a bit problematic. So you have, first of all, you have 
hierarchy from 2 to 30, you need to explore those. And then uh, here we run it only once, but if you run it multiple times, you will get different results as well. So it's a bit complicated to look at the result when you run it. SC3 is also stochastic, but because of the consensus, uh, it kind of stabilizes the solutions. Here, yes, but it's not implemented in the method. And um, so here, here there is an exercise if you run it for k equals 2. You can see that it's not, for example, I would say it should split this group from this group, but instead it takes this group but part of this large cluster as well. So not sure if, if it's the best solution for k equals 2. And then the next exercise is we want to compare SC3 and PCA reduce for k equals 11. And we do it using the, because PCA reduce is not integrated with scatter, so we want to write the results of PCA reduce to the scatter object so that we can visualize it on the heat map afterwards. So if you look at your RMD file, uh, you have solution to this exercise. Here, so we first write the results of PC reduce to, to the scatter object and then we plot expression uh, heat map, but we want to see the results of PC reduce. Um, and actually if you, if you look at it, for k equals 11, they are very similar. So uh, majority of the clusters are the same. So the white line lines define the clusters of SC3, and the colors here define the clusters of PCA reduce. So as you can see, this and this and this and this and this, this one, they're all the same. The purple cluster of PCA reduce was split in two clusters by SC3, right? This cluster, I'm not sure about the color. I think this cluster is the same as this one. So SC3 also split these two clusters, this cluster in two. So there are some differences actually. That's why when you, when you run your clustering algorithm, you, you need to probably run it uh, using a couple of different methods to see different results. Okay, any questions about PCA reduce? Next one is the TSNE plus K means. So this is again related to what we talked about yesterday. We can plot TSNE using skater function plot TSNE, right? So we don't want to invent a bicycle here. We just use what we have. Um, and if you also define this parameter, return as CS set equals true, uh, it will save the results, it will save the coordinates of TSNE plot to your skater object. Uh, and then we want to use those coordinates. Um, we want to use the coordinates of um, TSNE plot to do k-means clustering. So the coordinates are stored at, in the slot called uh, reduce dimension, right? And for example, here I'm asking k-means to find eight clusters uh, using TSNE coordinates. And then I want to color those clusters on the TSNE map. And I'm asking for eight clusters because by looking at this image, if you count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So visually, I found myself eight clusters after plotting TSNE. That's why I asked k-means to find eight clusters on TSNE map. But k-means sometimes uh, behaves weirdly. So you can see this cluster was split in two. So half of it belongs to this one. Half of it belongs to this one. 
and this one was split in two as well. So k-min sometimes is not performing well. <coughs> but again, this is like if you plot this knee of pollen date set, you'll find eight clusters instead of 11. But this is probably fine because as we saw in FC3, k equals nine was actually better than k equals 11, right? So there are three cell types which are very similar to each other. So k equals eight is similar to k equals nine. So probably TSNE is, is okay for this data set, but this data set is very nice and clean. So be aware that not every data set is like this. So you have a couple of exercises here. You can make the same plot for k equals 11. It's just running k-means for k equals 11. And if we compare the results of SC3 and TSNE k-means, this is the heat map. It's probably not, not the best way to compare the, result, the results, but at least it's something visual and you can explore. So for example, SC3 split this cluster defined by TSNE in two clusters, right? Uh, here we have quite a lot of clusters from TSNE in the same SC3 cluster and so on. Okay, so the next one is SNN click and this one is graph based method. So it creates a graph from your data. So there is a function which is called SNN provided in this package. And this package is actually our package. So you can look at this function yourself and see what it does. But also if you go to, to the original publication of SNN click, you will find out how to run it. So we create the SNN graph, and then you, it tries to find clusters in the graph. There are three parameters, no, four parameters that you have to define. You need to read about them in the publication as well. It's, it's hard to say what, what are the optimal values for those parameters, but when you run it, it also requires Python to be installed on your system. So th this is the output of the method. So it, find, it found 15 clusters and it gives you the results uh, in this file. So this is a deterministic method and there is only one single solution. And uh, if you run it again, you'll get the same thing. So it's on one hand, it's a nice way, it's a nice thing to have only single solution. So when you run it multiple times, it will be the same. But on the other hand, it's not flexible. So it's, it's hard to, like we know already that there are 11 cell types, but it tells you that there are 15. Yes. Stochastic. Well, if you want to, uh, yeah, the question is how to, um, what to do with the stochastic results because they, they, they are different every time you run it. Um, so to reproduce them, you just need to use the same random seed for, for the random number generator. So if you use the same seed, you will always get the same result. Uh, in terms of differences between the results, uh, usually they are very minor. So. If you have a structure in your data, you will most probably get the same structure. Uh, in ex like you, you might have few cells which are exceptions, which will jump from one cluster to another. But in general, it will be the same thing. But also, I mean, k-means, for example, is a stochastic method, right? But it's, it's, it's a standard method that's used everywhere and it's accepted by a lot of people. So. Stochasticity, stochasticity is not a bad thing and it's accepted by the research community. So 
I think it's fine. It's like the result, as I said, if you have a structure, you will get the same results, more or less. Okay, if you look at the results of SNM click, this is actually not very good. You can see that it finds like three clusters in this cloud, three clusters in this cloud. This one is a bit messy as well. So um, I'm not sure about the results of SNM click. Uh, ah, there is negative results. Oh, uh, oh yes, yes, you're right. I think negative means that the cells were unassigned, so they were not assigned to any of the clusters. I think so. So that that these are outliers, if I remember correctly. <coughs> yeah. So because you have 15, from 1 to 15, and it said it found 15 clusters, so these are outliers. Okay, next method is Sincera. Sincera is based on hierarchical clustering, very simple hierarchical clustering, the same as you have in the heat map function in your R. Uh, it, the only thing it does, it performs the gene level Z-score transformation before doing the clustering. So it just normalizes the genes uh, to zero mean and uh, one unit standard deviation. Um, so that's how we run it. We take the, again, it's not integrated with the skater object, so we use the same input object that we used uh, for PCA reduce. And then we transform the data using uh, Sincera function. Uh, okay, so there is additional step here. They calculate Pearson correlation in your data, and they use Pearson correlation for the hierarchical clustering instead of the actual expression values. Yes, yeah, so also Sincera provides a function to estimate K. Um, and they define this K as uh, the minimum height of the hierarchical tree that generates no more than a specified number of singleton clusters. Clusters contain only one cell. So basically, it just create this hierarchical structure and then it goes uh, down uh, in the tree. And when it finds a cluster with only one cell, it says that the previous step was the, op the K. Right? So it just finds it by looking at the size of the clusters. And if you run it, it finds 14. So k equals 14. Um, then we can visualize in several results. So here we're using the fit map function. That's, uh, that's the heat map package that we use in ST3 as well. And I think it's the best heat map, heat map package for R available at the moment. So I would recommend you to use this one. Um, so these are sincere results. And you can see the genes are normalized. So uh, it looks a bit different from ST3 heat map. And these are the 14 clusters that it found. And as you can see, there is one, two, three, quite a lot of clusters with, with very small number of cells. So the results are quite different from SC3 and from the original uh, cell labels. And again, we can write them to the skater object, the results of Sincera, and compare with the results of SC3, for example. And you can see some of the clusters are the same, only a few but the rest are quite different. Okay, so the last one is Surat. Uh, so here I'm, I'm just following the example that I, I've taken from the web page. Um, and I have changed uh, 
basically in, in most of the functions I just removed all the parameters and used the default parameters. Uh, they have quite a lot of parameters at, at every step of the clustering. Uh, so you need to go through the tutorial yourself if you want to understand, but here I'm just using the default, uh, default that they have. So at least you can reproduce uh, the steps by yourself and that it should work. So first of all, they calculate uh, the variance of each gene, I think, with this, well, they create, they create a Serrat object. So the conception is similar to Skater, but they have their own object, which is of Serrat class. They create this object, and then they also run everything uh, inside this object. Um, so first thing they do is they calculate the variance of each gene. Then they regress out uh, the genes with uh, the minimum variance. So they only leave the most important genes. Uh, they also, using this latent variable, number of UMIs. Uh, UMIs here is because majority of the data set that they work with are of ten, from 10x genomics, that's why it's default value. It's, that's, it's probably the, the same as the total counts in scatter object, but it's called number of UMIs in their data set. So then they do PCA on their data and they find, for each PC, they find the most uh, variable genes which correspond to this PC. Uh, that which contri contribute to this PC. And then they run TSME, and then they run the clustering algorithm, which is graph-based. And you can go to the publications that I mentioned before to see the de details of the algorithm. And then they plot TSME and visualize the clustering results from this function. So Surat found five clusters, and this is the TSNI map with uh, five clusters highlighted. So as I said, Surat is, it actually works for larger data sets. So I'm not sure about the performance on the smaller data sets, but in SC3 paper, for example, we compared uh, SC3 to Surat, to the previous version of Surat, when they used TSNI plot for clustering. And we found that in the previous version, Surat was not able to find any structure in smaller data sets. So for this one, it actually finds something, uh, but probably it's the best operating on larger data sets. So when they have 10,000 cells or more, probably you would get better results using Surat. And here we compare SC3 to Surat, and because Surat found much less clusters, so most of the Surat clusters are split in several by SC3. <coughs> yeah, so Surat also allows you to find marker genes, which is very useful. Um, so this function we run, we ask it to find marker genes of cluster two compared to all other clusters, right? So, and then when we plot it, it finds these are the top genes, top six genes we ask for. And you can see that cluster two, the expression of this gene is the highest. Here it's also the highest, here is a bit less. In this one, for example, it's not expressed in cluster two, but expressed every, everywhere else. So I think this is a nice uh, feature of Surat as well. And that's it. All right, so go, coming back to the question of reproducibility, if you want to run Surat with no errors, uh, what you can do is that 
um, to run our Docker image. So the course has a Docker image which you can run on your laptop and then you don't need to install anything. So if you install a Docker on your system and then run this command, it will open an R session for you where everything will be already installed. And uh, in this version, Surat should work. <laughs> Sorry? You've tried? Yes, that's a disadvantage, yeah. But at least you have everything installed, so you don't need to install any package. You just run the Docker and everything will be inside the Docker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't want to investigate, but I suppose. I mean, the website is generated from this Docker, so it works inside the Docker. That's what I can tell you for sure. Well, it, it creates HTML files inside the Docker. So it doesn't visualize it interactively, but for the files, it's fine. Yeah. All right. So Talula will, will continue now. <laughs>